Hello, I'm Vincent Guillermo Ramos, the Dean of the Duke University School of Nursing. I am here today with Dr. Ernest Grant, who is the Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. But most of you will know Dr. Grant as the immediate past president of the American Nurse Association. Welcome to our conversation today. We're delighted to have an opportunity mm -hmm. to address uh, the national DNP conference attendees. Congratulations on 16 years. I understand this is the 16th year of the conference. And both Dr. Grant and I are delighted to have this opportunity, uh, I'll mention that again, to really be with you all and to have what we hope will be a meaningful conversation about a topic that has been really pressing in nursing and more importantly in healthcare, diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm going to share a couple of, of uh, sort of thoughts about why this topic matters and throughout the next roughly hour, You'll hear from Dr. Grant and myself, and we'll be able to convey our own experiences, and hopefully that will have meaning to those of you that are watching. So thank you again for being with us today. The run of show is that we're going to start off by Dr. Grant talking a little bit about his career in nursing, and then we'll turn to my sharing my own reflections about my career in nursing and how DEI has mattered to us as individual nurses, leaders, uh, folks that have been in the nursing profession for some time. And then we're going to talk more broadly about health equity and the importance of DEI and how that relates to health equity. We'll turn uh, our attention to really a critical discussion around the status quo and sort of where we are as a profession, uh, as nurses, and how that uh, is either helping or not helping us in terms of achieving health equity. And then I think we'll end on a really positive note mm -hmm. where we will convey uh, what we see as being the bright and impactful future of nursing where, uh, in my view, there are limitless opportunities and where really DEI will play an important role in shaping uh, what I see as being a nursing profession that is revolutionized and that is uh, poised for change. So with that, I'm going to welcome Thanks. Dr. Grant to this conversation. It's great having this opportunity to be with you. Thanks for and the opportunity. maybe open it up uh, for you to kind of say a few words. Certainly. Well, um, as you just stated, I'm delighted to be here and to uh, share my experiences with the, uh, the audience and hopefully uh, uh, spur this conversation on to uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, action, I guess you could say. Uh, and I believe you said that I would start off by uh, talking about how I got into nursing. I'm happy to do that. Um, if you had told me back in uh, 1976 is when I started uh, that I would uh, be a nurse, I probably would have said no way. Uh, my ambition at the time was I wanted to be an anesthesiologist and drive a lime green 1968 Mercury Cougar. <laughs> uh, and for those in the audience who don't know what that car looks like, I suggest you Google it. You'll find out uh, it is it's still the car of my dream. So if you know of one, let me know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but my high school guidance counselor suggested that I um, consider going into nursing and become a nurse anesthetist. And then if I still wanted to go to medical school, I could work my way through med school as a nurse anesthetist. Uh, and the reason uh, that path was laid out was I was the youngest of seven kids, single parent, uh, very poor family. And uh, of course, back then there was very few, if any, scholarships for uh, definitely uh, persons of color uh, in order to uh, go not only to university, but uh, you know, even to go through med school. So <clears throat> I started out at the local uh, what we now know of as community, as community college, back then it was called the Technical Institute. That shows you how, how old I am. Uh, but um, I think about eh, six weeks or so into the nursing program, I found that nursing was my calling and that mm -hmm. I really loved um, what it is that we as nurses do and uh, wanted to be able to do more. So once I uh, finished that program, this was a LPN program. So as soon as I finished that, I uh, immediately started taking courses towards uh, getting my baccalaureate degree and subsequently after getting the baccalaureate degree wanted to be able to do more so I realized that that would require a master's degree and then subsequently the, uh, the PhD. But all along um, being a, a servient leader, being uh, someone who advocates not only for the profession but also for the uh, patients that uh, we care for and also advocating for more diversity within the profession as well. So that sort of has, has been my journey. Uh, but, and it is something that is still ongoing. Uh, obviously, we definitely uh, realize that this is something that's not gonna change overnight. 
Um, and it is a slow journey, but it is one that is um, uh, definitely needed, and I think uh, many in the audience would agree with that. Uh, I will talk about just a couple of challenges, if you don't mind, that I had going into the nursing field, particularly in the mid-70s, being you know, uh, a male to begin with, African-American as a second uh, uh, thing, being perceived as either an orderly or uh, perhaps uh, you know, maybe as a uh, nursing assistant. Um, and I remember a lot of times, my first job was on a med surge floor. And, uh, and we would get um, you know, a lot of you know, very uh, obese patients in. Um, you know, one of the uh, particular physicians in the town uh, would, uh, he wanted his patients on our floor because we uh, provided the best care. And uh, I was always being asked, you know, can you help us, you know, lift this patient over and et cetera. And I would say, well, yeah, I really don't mind this, but tell me, what would you do if I wasn't here today? Uh, you know, uh, I was taking the advice of someone who said, don't let them use you as an orderly. You are a nurse. You took the exact same courses that they took. And, um, you know, you should be um, granted the same privileges that, uh, you know, that they did. Another thing would be uh, because we'd also get orthopedic overflow, and so there'd be a lot of, you know, during the uh, fall and winter months, a lot of young men who would be injured, like in, you know, playing football or, you know, things like that with a broken leg or so, and would be in traction. And so um, they would have a Foley in them. And, you know, again, a lot of the young nurses, you know, could you put this Foley in, you know, in this young guy? And, you know, I'm like, well, why can't you do it? You know, if I have to put a Foley in a, you know, in a female, why can't you do it as well? So eventually, I think they, they got the message. But again, <clears throat> when you think about how uh, easily sometimes people can misconstrue or think of you, even though you have the same training, you, um, you know, pass the exact same exam that they did, you're just as qualified as they are, but yet they want to perhaps treat you as someone less than or to do what they may think of as uh, um, you know, duties that, uh, uh, that they were too good to do. Um, but you kill them with kindness to, uh, you know, to get them to think otherwise and to uh, see that um, you know, no, this person deserves the same uh, respect, the same um, uh, you know, accountability, if you will, as, uh, you know, as uh, you know, his colleagues. So, um, you know, and, and that's something that I've dealt with even after achieving the baccalaureate degree, the master's degree, moving into positions of leadership. Um, all of those are, uh, you know, s still some of the things you have to confront. I find that, Dr. Grant, really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share in a second my own story mm -hmm. and how I came to nursing. Mm -hmm. But I think um, what I'm hearing and what you're sort of uh, communicating, my understanding, is really this important uh, sort of intersection between deep commitment to the profession mm -hmm. and knowing from fairly early on that you wanted to work within health and sort of being captivated by nursing as the way that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And also as an individual, as a male, as an African-American male, having an experience that wasn't always in an alignment mm -hmm. with um, what your skills, your sort of knowledge, mm -hmm. competence, what you could contribute. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm going to maybe talk a little bit about my own, and then I'll come mm -hmm. back and okay. sort of we can build on that and sort mm -hmm. of continue our conversation. Certainly. So <clears throat> one of the things I uh, often think about is, well, what sort of led me to nursing? And like you, I never imagined that I would be a nurse. <laughs> I uh, would be totally dishonest if I said that I envisioned myself being a nurse. Today, I am a nurse, um, and I'm very happy and proud to be a nurse. I think my path towards nursing was heavily shaped by my upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that in your story as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in the South Bronx. Uh, my mom was from Puerto Rico, and my father was from the Dominican Republic, from Santo Domingo. And we grew up in a community that was primarily Latino, about 75% mm -hmm. of the people in my neighborhood back in the South Bronx were Latino. They're large immigrant population, mm -hmm. Spanish speaking, and the 25 uh, percent remaining is African-American mm -hmm. and so that was the context of my upbringing and I think what's really interesting about that is that I didn't have much of a sense of what life looked like outside of my neighborhood because for the most part we stayed in sort of our community in mm -hmm. the South Bronx and why that matters is because as I was getting older and I was traveling into Manhattan and other parts of New York City 
I started to notice that there were differences between my neighborhood mm -hmm. and other communities in New York City. And I was sort of interested in those differences. Mm -hmm. And as I looked out of the window of, imagine a yellow school bus that was taking us uh, to a museum, mm -hmm. I was in awe of how people live differently. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the vocabulary, the understanding at that time to really make sense of it. But as I got older and went off to college, I became really interested in sort of the reasons why people find themselves in disadvantage and then what we could do to somehow prevent individuals, families, communities from finding themselves in circumstances of disadvantage. And so that led me first to becoming fascinated with the profession of social welfare because I felt like the values of social justice and the real commitment from a particular case to a broader cause and that connection from the micro to the macro mm -hmm was something that really resonated with me. And I worked for many years as a social worker with adolescents and their families. Many of the issues that I cared about and that were pervasive at the time were in the area of health. And you know, my expertise is in sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And I was working a lot with unplanned pregnancies, with sexually transmitted infections, later became here at Duke University a specialist in the care of people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And I always had my eye on young people. Mm -hmm. And I think what I was thinking when I was sort of working as a social worker is that I wanted to do more. Mm -hmm. And that I really wanted to combine the social and the psychological with the biological. Mm -hmm. And that for me, the perfect combination where I could do community work, where I could still have a patient or a case, but maintain the social welfare commitment to the broader cause was by the marriage of social welfare and nursing. Mm -hmm. And that led me to being the nurse that I am today, where I really pride myself on clinical expertise, but that's a smaller part of the equation for me. I think what I really enjoy is the combination of the clinical expertise with a deep understanding of what today I call social determinants of health mm -hmm. and the importance of health equity. That's been my North Star, you know, Dr. Grant. Mm -hmm. It's been what has propelled me, what I feel most proud of mm -hmm. in nursing, and what I think for many communities that may be viewing uh, this particular conversation, I would hope that many of you are thinking about our nation's health and how we can address the harmful social determinants of health. So with that, I'm gonna zoom in on a follow-up mm -hmm. question for you, because I would like to <clears throat> understand a little more. You've had a prolific mm -hmm career in nursing. You're one of the most mm -hmm. recognized nurse leaders in the country. And wherever I go, Dr. Grant, people know you. Mm -hmm. They have uh, deep respect and trust of your leadership. And they continue to see all the ways that you have led, particularly in your, your most recent uh, sort of past role of being the immediate past president of the American Nurse Association. Mm -hmm. You have been a major figure in nursing. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand that, and I want to understand how that led you to what I see as being some of the most uh, influential work that you've done, which has been around racism in nursing and thinking through uh, how we as a profession need to somehow reconcile our history, the great work we've done, mm -hmm. with some of the sensitive sore spots that remain unaddressed. Great question. I, I, I think um, probably what really even though I addressed or began to address uh, you know, the racism issue that we have in nursing before assuming up to the national level, you know, so to speak, with the work that I did at the state and national level, uh, excuse me, the uh, state and, and local level, um, and, and you know, pointing out that we needed more diversity on, on boards. Um, getting nurses of color to join their professional organization. Part of that was instilled in me in my undergraduate education, my baccalaureate education, when my professors, I can still hear them to this very day saying, you know, if you're going to consider yourself a professional nurse, you need to join your professional organization. And my undergrad is from uh, HBCU, uh, and um, like a lot of um, baccalaureate prepared students or even maybe those who have an associate degree you probably were encouraged to go to your uh, either uh, local chapter of your state nurses association meeting and to see what was going on or even to go to the uh, state uh, 
uh, state meeting of the uh, State Nurses Association. And we had the same thing. Uh, and of course, you got a little extra credit for, uh, you know, for, for doing that. But the surprise was when you got to those meetings, your professors were there. They weren't just there just to check the role to see who was, you know, who was at the meeting and who was not. But I found them at the microphone asking those challenging questions. Uh, also chairing committees, uh, you know, so they were in essence showing us, you know, this is how you do it uh, in order to, uh, to be a professional. And if you want to have change to occur, you have to be the change that you want to, to see happen. In other words, you need to join the professional organization, uh, get on committees where you can have your sphere of influence and uh, promote change that way very simple recipe, if you will. And uh, you know, so I started implementing that, not only uh, in my uh, early work uh, that I was doing, but also, uh, again, as I stated, um, at the uh, state level with the uh, North Carolina Nurses Association. And then subsequently I got uh, you know, uh, selected to serve on a few committees within the ANA as well. I think what brought about the, the real boost, if you will, towards um, uh, the um, you know, the, the national uh, movement towards to, to begin to address racism within the profession. Obviously, like everyone else, it started with the murder of George Floyd. Uh, when you look back and saw the, uh, you know, the, the murders of other uh, people of color, uh, George Floyd was just the tipping point. But um, I, I think, uh, again, to, to realize the uh, not only the inequities in healthcare that uh, you know, uh, people from the BIPOC community uh, endure and, and continue to uh, endure, um, you know, that just brought it all to, to, uh, to light, to the forefront. And being the nurse that I am, it's impossible to just sit back and just let that happen. You have to do something. Uh, you know, if you truly are <clears throat> committed to who you are as a nurse, that means not only taking care of a patient when they are not well, but it also means taking care of them when they are well, because you, you know, the biggest part, if you ask me, by taking care of them when they're well, you're, you know, you don't need to see them when they become ill. And so addressing those things that um, would uh, ensure their health and wellness, uh, be it their living conditions, be it, um, uh, you know, their environment, uh, maybe there, or policies or, or laws or things like that, that uh, contributes to the inequity, we've got to uh, begin to address that. But it truly was the, uh, the murder of George Floyd that, um, uh, and I will say that I had a very progressive board uh, at the ANA that also saw that uh, this was wrong and that we needed to address this. And so we formed the Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. And um, one of the things that I said on the very first day of the Commission meeting was that we are expecting that a policy or a document or a white paper would come out of what the work that we do. However, ANA as a co-convener of this commission, we have to clean our own closet, just like all the other uh, member organizations that were participating. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know about you, but ANA itself needs to address its past behavior towards nurses of color. Uh, the audience may not know, but it wasn't until the late 50s uh, that black nurses were able to actually be a member of ANA. And uh, also, it was probably about 10 years later that not only were they now a member, but they could finally hold office. Uh, I, you mentioned I'm the immediate past president, but I'm the third African American to have served as president in the 128 year history of ANA and the first male uh, to serve in that position. This is 2023. <laughs> that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make sense that uh, you know, it would take that long uh, for, uh, you know, for events like that to happen. And I certainly hope and pray that A, I'm not the last person of color to occupy the office of president for ANA, and B, that I'm not the last male to occupy the office of president of ANA. Um, you know, we definitely have to uh, begin to address that. And part of that is how we, as a profession, the most trusted profession, how we can promote social change as well, um, you know, from members of society. We need to, again, model the behavior that we expect the rest of society to, uh, 
uh, to, to, to follow as well. It's wonderful. There's a couple of things that you shared, Dr. Grant, mm -hmm. that I sort of want to develop a little bit, and then I'm going to come back uh, for a follow-up mm -hmm. question. I've been writing down some notes. So the first thing is that we've been using the term inequity, mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. folks talk about a negative health outcome, or they talk mm -hmm. about a disparity, and I think we've been very intentional mm -hmm. about referring to inequity. So I just want to take a second to define my understanding of what an inequity is. It moves beyond simply an outcome, positive right. or negative. It moves beyond just uh, this idea that there are systematic patterns uh, that are uh, clustered in certain individuals or populations or communities, which is what a disparity is. It really speaks to the unfair and the unjust clustering and systematic patterns of negative outcomes in individuals and families and communities. And that unfair and unjust aspect is what drives the term mm -hmm. inequity. Right. I think that um, you shared something else that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Often we're looking for someone else to be the mm -hmm. solution. We're yes. looking for some organization mm -hmm. or some leader that uh, has the answer to what it is that we should do. And I think part of what was in your message is that each of us as nurses, mm -hmm. irrespective of our position, irrespective of where we sit in the nursing profession, that we are the solution to our country's healthcare challenges. <clears throat> Excuse me. That we are the solution to our country's healthcare challenges, and that the issues around inequity, that they're going to be solved by each one of us mm -hmm. stepping Absolutely. forward, becoming involved, and collectively the impact will be amplified. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about. <clears throat> the current state of health in our country. And I'm going to bring that back to DEI. And I mm -hmm. think I'm going to ask us to, uh, in our conversation, talk about why mm -hmm. DEI matters. And I'm going to invite you, Dr. Grant, in just a couple of minutes to put on your um, sort of your cap as the Vice mm -hmm. Dean for Diversity, Equity, mm -hmm. and Inclusion at the Duke University School of Nursing. We're really proud that you're here and that you've chosen to be part of our institution. We're honored by mm -hmm. your joining us. and we want to figure out how you're joining us and the opportunity of your being part of our school is helping to advance not only our school but the broader issues in health and in nursing. So let's just take a moment to talk about where we are in health. So DNP colleagues, you know, where we are right now in our country is that we have uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, more than 40 years of increases in life expectancy that have actually been going in now the wrong direction. We have life expectancy at an all-time low in terms of uh, drops in the amount of years that an individual has. If we look geographically in our country, we see certain patterns where if you are living, for example, in the Southeast, that the average life expectancy relative to other parts in the country is much less. We know that today the vast majority of American adults have at least one or more chronic conditions. We know that we spend billions of dollars right now in what we call uh, sort of preventable bad care, care that if we had really prevented or optimized or done um, sort of what the standard is in terms of providing really good care, that we could have avoided those unnecessary costs. We know that we've got problems with the allocation of our resources, that some people have access to care, some don't. Some people are able to get things like vaccines or treatments, mm -hmm. medications, a primary care provider, some can't or don't. And we also know when you mention this, that the conditions in which people live and the social determinants of health, that that has a massive impact on the inequities that we see in health. And that if we, as a profession, the largest, the most trusted, extremely skilled, which often is not part of the narrative when we say most trusted and largest, but extremely skilled mm -hmm. nursing workforce, that if we are not part of the solution, if we don't lead the solution, that what we're really looking at is the inability to disrupt these patterns. 80% mm -hmm. of what we see in terms of a negative outcome and inequity is really tied to the social context in which people live, they work, they play. 20% is tied to clinical care. Mm -hmm. Most of what we do in terms of our training as nurses, the examples that you gave mm -hmm. earlier, Dr. Grant, mm -hmm. were about Foley's or moving mm -hmm. people 
from you know positioning them differently in the, when they're in an acute care setting, most of what I learned in my nursing program was clinical. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I didn't fully understand that I now understand mm -hmm. is that nursing is that clinical expertise, that mm -hmm. 20 percent, mm -hmm. and it's the 80 percent mm -hmm. that I didn't learn about. Mm -hmm. And that really the future of nursing and the future of how we can reduce the inequities that we see, which too often are among communities of color and other uh, marginalized groups, it, we have to combine those two things together. Absolutely. So I'm curious about, here's my question for you. My question is, as the Vice Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, you lead uh, the efforts here at the Duke University School of Nursing. You've also played an instrumental role mm -hmm. in nursing. Many people respect you. Mm -hmm. They see you as an important voice. Mm -hmm. Why does DEI matter in terms of health inequities? And what should schools of nursing and other nursing organizations do in order to advance health equity? That's a really great question. First of all, let me say that I'm uh, delighted to have joined the faculty here at the, uh, the Duke uh, University School of Nursing and to uh, further the work uh, that I want to achieve in addressing DEI. I, I think why DEI matters is because, as you sort of alluded to, it, um, it means better outcome for the, the people that we care for, either in the acute care setting or the non-acute uh, setting. If you think about it, if you've ever been hospitalized and you look around, you don't see anyone that looks like you, you, uh, you feel very isolated. Um, you know, can I speak up or can I say, you know, such and such things that perhaps, uh, you know, people may, may fully understand where I'm coming from. So I, I think by seeing someone who looks like you that can uh, advocate on your behalf, that can, uh, you know, as a part of the team that can say, wait a minute, guys, you know, this person is from this culture or, you know, or this religion or, or whatever. This is how they view health and health care. It isn't just taking Western medicine and saying, we know what's best for you. It's inviting you to come in and be a part of the team that's going to help you to get better uh, and not just automatically assume dominance. So that's one thing. The other thing, and uh, let me address, say, the, the recent Supreme Court ruling when, uh, you know, about admissions uh, to uh, various schools and colleges. When you consider the impact that that's going to have on the nursing profession as well, that too may just limit the amount of diversity that schools of nursing will be able to have. We've got to be able to figure out some way, and we're in the process of doing that, but, uh, but that is going to uh, d dilute the, uh, you know, the number of individuals from diverse backgrounds who may be considering nursing as a profession. Uh, they may, um, you know, miss the mark, so to speak, or they may not be admitted. So therefore, you know, two, three, five, seven, ten years down the road, again, we're going to be right back where we were about 20, 30 years ago, and not very many uh, um, nurses of color choosing the nursing profession, or maybe they're choosing it, but they don't get in because of, uh, you know, some of the um, uh, stumbling blocks that may be there. So what can we do as, as schools? So we can specifically um, you know, target, um, you know, uh, minority students to, uh, you know, to want to come to schools like Duke or to other universities. And, uh, but we need to also address, you know, what may be a hindrance for them. Is it funding, you know, then offer more scholarships? Is it uh, perhaps uh, maybe they need, in order to, to meet the, some of the, the rigorous criteria, give them some, um, uh, remedial education or, or things like that that would help to bring them up to par to where they can meet the admission standards. Uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, uh, individuals out there who probably could be great nurses, but they're not given a chance because there's too many stumbling blocks that are in, in the road. So that's what I see my job is uh, addressing this, is to ensure that everyone has an equal 
uh, chance to walk through these doors here at Duke or you know, for those who are listening and maybe in my position of DEI and other uh, universities uh, across the, the country as well, you need to do everything in your power to make sure that um, you know, uh, that is addressed and that your, each one of your classes are reflective of the people that you care for. Uh, so, um, you know, we need to um, ensure that that continues. Otherwise, uh, again, we're going to be going back to, uh, you know, nursing being a predominantly, well, it is a predominantly white, blonde, female you know, profession. And, um, you know, no one will feel that they, uh, if you're a minority, you're going to feel that you don't have a voice. And mm -hmm. you need to be able to have that voice, um, you know, and how care is done. And um, it also leads to research. I mean, when you look mm -hmm. at research that may occur, you know, does it really address, you know, uh, the minority population or, um, you know, if not, then why? We need to question that. Mm -hmm. We need to challenge that. We need to make sure that more research dollars go to uh, minority researchers so that, again, they can contribute to that body of work and say, yeah, this drug may work well in this population, but in this population, we, you know, we have some complications or, uh, or uh, address, again, the lifestyle uh, or the culture of um, uh, minority populations so that, again, we can take that into c consideration. Uh, so I don't know if that fully answers your question sure. there, but that's my uh, I think it's take on things. I think it's a great, a great uh, way to continue going deeper. And mm -hmm. I, I want to share a couple of thoughts, and I also want to you know, ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that stand out for me. So first, I want to focus on research and you know i see myself mm -hmm. as a neuroscientist mm -hmm. and as i've read the literature on diversity equity and inclusion there are a number of things that stand out mm -hmm. and i think that probably the most profound thing the single most important thing that i would want folks to take away from our conversation is that when we have a diverse workforce mm -hmm. we get better outcomes yes and that diversity within itself in our nursing workforce that it improves care, particularly for the most uh, sort of you know minoritized populations, mm -hmm. the populations that are typically underserved, and that are experiencing the greatest security in terms of their chronic condition or whatever it is that they're grappling with. And so there's very strong research that has shown time and time again, mm -hmm. and a lot of that work comes out of the African American community, yes. mm -hmm. that when we have symmetry between African American providers and patients that we see improvements. Mm -hmm. We see more likelihood of preventative screenings, mm -hmm. of treatments that are preventative, more uh, improved outcomes, greater okay. satisfaction. And more compliance. And more well. adherence mm -hmm. to the care mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. being offered. And so I want to really make sure that we keep that front and center mm -hmm. because sometimes, Dr. Grant, people will say, well, why should we care about ensuring that we have a diverse workforce? Is, is it just the morally correct thing to do. And I want to suggest that, yes, we know that we want to have institutions and a society that is inclusive of everyone, but it's not just about correct. the moral imperative. Correct. It's about we get better care mm -hmm. in the patient populations when we have a diverse workforce. And I want to challenge something that I feel really strongly mm -hmm. about. Sometimes we talk about, you know, you use the word remediation, and mm -hmm. I don't want to mm -hmm. put you on the spot, mm -hmm. But there's a set of criteria that many institutions use mm -hmm. to think about who is eligible and who is not eligible mm -hmm. to attend whatever the school mm -hmm. is for our purposes mm -hmm. of nursing. If we look at our profession, which is a fantastic profession, and we look at the current state of health in our country, there's a bit of a disconnect for me because mm -hmm. as a country, healthcare is struggling. Mm -hmm. And yet we have these fantastic institutions. Mm -hmm. I happen to be a graduate of one of them, Duke University School of Nursing. But I want to challenge us because it would be too easy for me to simply assert that because we have many great schools of nursing, mm -hmm. that somehow we've done our job or that we have gotten it right. And I wonder if we were to not think about candidates as necessarily requiring remediation but if we could think of candidates from a lens that what they bring, mm -hmm. that they have that is innate to their experiences, whether they be lived experiences or their academic experiences, their professional experiences, that those very uh, competencies, those very 
uh, skills, assets, that that's mm -hmm. actually what's currently missing oh, absolutely. from our current nursing workforce. Mm -hmm. And that rather than think, let's give them remediation mm -hmm. to be more like us, mm -hmm. that perhaps it's more about how do we bring what they already have into what we call the nursing education experience. And that there's really a bi-directional way in which schools and the profession are being enriched by the expertise and perspective of both different segments of our nursing workforce. I would agree with you wholeheartedly, uh, but I, I also think, and maybe remediation was a poor choice of words, but if you have someone where English is not a language that they're proficient in, or if it's someone who, um, uh, but yet they have perhaps worked as a, uh, a nursing assistant mm -hmm. uh, on a, a floor and just done an absolutely fantastic job and probably been told by uh, a lot of individuals that, uh, oh, you'd make a wonderful nurse, why don't you go to nursing school? But then they may have trouble understanding um, you know, what is written uh, in English because again, it's not their uh, you know their uh, primary language. So perhaps that's um, you know I guess it was a, a poor choice of words. But those are some ways that I uh, that I see that schools of nursing could still benefit from what you said. You know, bringing in their life experience, um, but also because you know chances are uh, if they may struggle with trying to comprehend what may be in the textbook or or uh, what may be on the exam. It's a way to bring them up to a certain level to where they, they can be. It's helping them to be successful, not to punish them because they do not speak English um, or comprehend English as well as someone who, uh, you know, where English is their primary language. I really appreciate you providing that additional perspective. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I wouldn't suggest that it's a poor choice of words. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest is that what you said can be true. The mm -hmm. very example that mm -hmm. you just offered is one that I think is 100% accurate. And I know that in the community where I worked at Montefiore Medical Center mm -hmm. in the South Bronx, I mentioned that I grew up in a community that 75% of the population mm -hmm. was <coughs> Latino and Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And in that community, your ability to communicate as a healthcare provider in Spanish, your ability to culturally understand the mm -hmm. community, your ability to engage and really engage in ways that you can be respectful of Latino experiences mm -hmm. is instrumental to being successful as a healthcare worker, mm -hmm. as a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so in this example, Dr. Grant, I'm, I'm trying to assert and I'm trying to share that both are true, mm -hmm. that what mm -hmm. we have is a candidate who may uh, require some additional support in some mm -hmm. traditional areas mm -hmm that are fundamental to the way that nursing has been shaped historically and even today, and that those very individuals may bring assets and experiences yes. that are yeah. not reflected in what we need today in our nursing workforce, and that both of those things can be true in terms of how we move forward. Absolutely, absolutely. So I wanna ask you about schools. So you started talking about schools, and I really, mm -hmm love what you said about uh, addressing the barriers. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, uh, I've been at a number of academic institutions before I arrived at Duke, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that there are many institutions, whether they be academic or not, mm -hmm. that typically have an office. They might not have an office, but let's imagine that mm -hmm. uh, post-George mm -hmm. Floyd, many institutions have a DEI office. Mm -hmm. And in those offices, there may be a set of activities mm -hmm. or there may be things that are going on that are the institution's response to how they're addressing mm -hmm. DEI. I'm curious if you can address and your thoughts on really meaningful programming, what really matters, mm -hmm. what uh, should be the way that institutions can provide DEI expertise <coughs> and leadership that have the potential for impact and move beyond we have that position, mm -hmm. we have that office, yes. it's yeah. there. Instead of just checking a box, checking so to speak. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think what's important is, um, I'm a firm believer all, all throughout my nursing career of making sure that we ask the end user. Um, you know, if um, when I was a staff nurse in the hospital and uh, if they were building a new addition onto the hospital, mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you're getting all this high technology equipment and et cetera, but they fail to ask the nurses who are going to be using it. And, and I can specifically recall one incident where um, uh, the particular hospital where I was working at, they, you know, they built a new wing on and it was for adults, but the doors were too small for adult beds to, you know, to go in and out. And whereas nurses, you know, told them and also told them that, you know, the, the way they had set up the, uh, you know, the head panel, you know, like the suction equipment and things like that was, was all wrong. Again, perfect example of where you should ask the end user as to how would you design this to where it's more, uh, more uh, proficient. I think that's the same thing we should start with, with uh, when addressing uh, DEI within the nursing uh, school uh, curriculum as well, is talk with the students and ask them, what is it that you need? In other words, you want that student to have a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And uh, what does belonging look like to them? Uh, and incorporate that into uh, your curriculum, incorporate that into your culture of the school so that mm -hmm. uh, they feel welcome, they feel I am a part of this, that they really value the contribution that I will bring. And subsequently, when that person graduates, obviously, you think of the, the ripple effect, what they're, they're gonna take what they learned here and the fact that they have felt uh, uh, that they belong, that they made that contribution, but subsequently as they either um, go for an advanced degree or even go out into the, uh, the work environment, that ripple effect will continue to follow them. I think it's also important that they look around and again, just as we were just talking about, that they see people who look like them, that, uh, that when they are struggling, that it is someone that, can, uh, that they can perhaps turn to and say, uh, you know, I'm struggling here, what can, uh, you know, what are the resources or things that may be available for me to help me to be successful instead of in the past? Uh, I, you know, recall through some of our listening sessions with the commission, nurses of color, you know, saying automatically the, the door was in their face by uh, faculty saying, oh, well, people like you have always had a difficult time here or they have not been successful here. So when you hear words like that, you already know that, um, you know, the, the cards are stacked against you. So what are you going to do to overcome those barriers or, you know, to try to, we realize you're going to have to work twice as hard to get uh, what other um, students may be uh, achieving and still you don't get the recognition. Uh, you know, they're mm -hmm. still are going to call into question your ability or your um, uh, your um, ability to either uh, be successful or your ability to be uh, a, a nurse at the end. So uh, I think, again, asking the student, the student feeling belonging, but then also having available uh, resources that they can uh, you know take advantage of. And I think it's important that faculty also, um, even though you know we do DEI training, uh, you know that's one thing, but you got to put that into action. I think it's important that faculty take the uh, the action mode, if you will, or change the behavior and actually put that into action, so that um, you know we can be more successful. Also, as opposed to just you know they're just thinking that oh yeah, well I understand this is uh, this might be microaggression or or things of this sort, but. Actually, when you see that happening, you know, you want to change that behavior, even if it does mean correcting your own colleagues, that you can't say or do things like that. This is, um, you know, becoming allies on behalf of the students um, and the staff and the faculty as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all of us working together to help change the, um, uh, the behaviors that we're seeing so that uh, we are more of a community, if you will. And, uh, and a, a more successful community. I really liked what you shared. There are a couple of things that stood out from my point of view that I want to mm -hmm. highlight, and I'm going to follow up with another, another question. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to share is that I, I think too often I have seen in institutions that there's been either nothing happening mm -hmm. and there isn't an office at mm -hmm. all, or there's an office that maybe has someone, but there's no real programming, mm -hmm. there's no real support, there's no resources, there's no budget, mm -hmm. there's really no opportunity to enact some of the programming, strategic programming, mm -hmm. that would advance the DEI work. Mm -hmm. That's sort of one model. The other model that I see is that sometimes there's almost a, a kind of um, 
frantic set of programs mm -hmm. where there's many things going on and there's a collage that comes together and it becomes unclear mm -hmm. to know what exactly should we be doing. And so from my view as a neuroscientist and as the dean of the school, I really think a lot about what evidence do we have mm -hmm. for what works. And I want to encourage the folks that are attending this conference to think about this uh, very extensive DEI literature and what do we know that actually has an impact and to focus on a couple of those things that have the ability to be significant in transforming the work, however you define the work, whether it be in your patient population, whether it be in the community organization, whether it be in the healthcare setting mm -hmm. or the school, and to really zoom in on what has the greatest value. One of the things that I know it can sometimes be sensitive, Dr. Grant, you beautifully sort of walked around this issue. I'm going to go a little bit more direct and kind of uh, you know highlight it. Mm -hmm. So much of what I've experienced as a nurse uh, has been opportunities to receive training. Mm -hmm. And the training that I've received has raised my awareness, it's given me a new language, it's exposed me to ideas. But the fundamental question that I think has been pretty um, sort of unclear until much of the research has been reviewed is whether or not those trainings result in behavioral changes in the mm -hmm. provision of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we know is that training can be helpful. I don't want to suggest that training can't be helpful. Mm -hmm. But you said something that was really important. Mm -hmm. You said that the training has to move beyond mm -hmm. simply knowledge or awareness. Mm -hmm. Historically, that would mean that it wouldn't be an hour lunchtime sort of uh, mm -hmm. meeting or it wouldn't be something that you just do online. Mm -hmm. It would be ongoing, applied, behaviorally focused training that places us as nurses mm -hmm. and health mm -hmm. providers more broadly in situations where we have to practice what it is that we're learning from the training. That kind of training actually is not what most institutions do. Mm -hmm. And so I want to highlight that if we are using cultural competency or we are implementing mm -hmm. critical bias mm -hmm. training or mm -hmm. other kinds of cultural intelligence training, that that's fantastic. That's wonderful mm -hmm. work that without the sort of specific mm -hmm. provision of a focus mm -hmm. on application, it's raising awareness, it's mm -hmm. increasing our knowledge, but it's pretty clear from the research that that within itself is not going to resolve the health inequities. We've got um, a fantastic scholar at Harvard. His name is Dr. David Williams. Many of you probably know Dr. Williams. And recently I had the honor of listening to him at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, where he was part of a public session. You can see on the Unequal Treatment Revisited uh, webpage, you can see his lecture where he mm -hmm. really reviews the evidence. And there's a couple mm -hmm. of things, Dr. Grant, that he says that are amazing. He reinforces this point about training being uh, inadequate if it doesn't incorporate mm -hmm. the behavioral mm -hmm. skill practice, if it isn't intentional, deliberate, ongoing. But he says two things that were even more striking to me. He says that the best way forward the way that there has been the most evidence right now in 2023 that we have is by diversifying the workforce. Mm -hmm. That if we have a diverse workforce, and he gives an example of African American physicians and all the benefits mm -hmm. that come to African American patients mm -hmm. because of the symmetry between their provider and the patient population. So I want to say to all of the DNP folks that are attending this conference, if you are someone who is a member of a minoritized group, then it's important that you continue to practice in whatever form that you see appropriate and care for the populations that are in alignment with your unique talents and expertise. Because the truth is we see improvements Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Doesn't mean that you can only work with those <laughs> populations. It doesn't mean that uh, non-minoritized nurse mm -hmm. practitioners or DNPs cannot work with minoritized populations. But it means we're going to have to do more work. We're going to have to Absolutely. practice. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to take intentional steps mm -hmm. to go deeper and to figure out what it is 
that results in better outcomes when there's symmetry. And part of that goes back to what we uh, had stated earlier, by having a diverse workforce, again, that person can uh, tell or impart to members of the healthcare team mm -hmm. that when you're dealing with this culture uh, or this particular person or, or whatever, that these are some other things you might want to be thinking about so that you know, after doing that enough, if you, uh, if you know, if we take what Dr. Williams said, and you know, having a diverse um, uh, group of uh, employees or faculty or, or whatever, uh, that after a while it becomes ingrained in them as well, so that they know to perhaps automatically think that oh, in addition to just treating this illness that brought you here, I'm also going to be maybe pre-screening you for this or that or or, or whatever. Uh, or maybe I get a little better understanding of the community that you come from and what are the resources in that community that I know that is there that we can use or that isn't there that maybe we should begin to target uh, that is put there so that, again, it makes life better for the individuals that live in that community and uh, we can begin to advocate uh, on their behalf so that those resources are there and they don't have to take three or four buses to come and see me in the, the clinic and I can only address this one issue because I've got you know, 20 minutes of which 15 I'm going to be spending charting and only five listening to you, uh, you know, and working up a, a diagnosis or doing that follow-up. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, that just reinforces that all the way around. Great comments, Dr. Grant. So there's another piece that I want to highlight of what Dr. Williams shared, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to come to sort of uh, maybe a final question mm -hmm. and some concluding comments of what we want our audience to know. So the first thing I'd like to share is, uh, or the final thing about Dr. Williams, I should say, is that the other piece of his presentation is that he talked quite a bit about residential segregation. Mm -hmm. And in that articulation of his describing neighborhoods, he described the social conditions, the social determinants of health, and how those things like income inequality, poverty, how people were clustered and segregated within certain geographic mm -hmm. spaces, that that within itself impacts health inequity. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I mention that is because it really speaks to why nursing has to have the 20% mm -hmm. clinical mm -hmm. expertise mm -hmm. and the 80% mm -hmm. of the social context. And that the future of our profession, the workforce that we uh, are and can be even more, is a profession that is combining the 20 and the 80. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to highlight that final question and then we're gonna wrap up. And I'd like to ask Dr. Grant if there's something that you want to convey directly <coughs> to the audience and maybe you can look directly <laughs> at the audience at the and say, and what is it that you want folks to know that's important about DEI and achieving health equity for our nation and globe? That's a really great question, and, and I think what is so important that um, you know that it is um, something that we all need to work on. That it's important that we uh, work together to be allies as we uh, uh, start this journey and uh, and do this work and embrace everyone, every culture. Everyone has uh, something to contribute to our initiative that we are, are doing here. So um, it's extremely important that uh, you find your voice and that you um, promote um, you know, what is right. Uh, you know, that's essentially it. And as you mentioned earlier, we have better outcomes when we are able to address uh, or, or when healthcare is being uh, uh, provided by members of you know, all communities, not just one or two uh, specific communities. So I want to wrap up by thanking Dr. Grant for his leadership for many, many decades in the nursing profession and really saying again what an honor it is to have you here at the Duke University School of Nursing. I do want to highlight in terms of my final uh, comments, I just want to brag a little bit about the school because I think much of what Dr. Grant has shared is what we're doing here at Duke. And so one, we have focused and we are focusing on some strategic initiatives we are leaning in on how we can better support and address barriers to students attending the Duke Nursing School. And so that means thinking about how we allocate our financial resources, our scholarships. 
We are thinking critically about our curriculum and how we can reimagine that curriculum in ways that incorporates skills and practice and ongoing work around addressing inequitable care. And we as a school have gotten really serious about providing uh, thought <coughs> leadership and advocacy across the country in nursing and more broadly in health around effective ways of mitigating the harmful social determinants of health. If you haven't seen it, check out Doosan. Uh, trailblazer.com. It's an interactive website. It has a lot of the resources and the latest science and application to how nurses, the largest, most trusted, and expert workforce, can uh, improve health equity for our nation. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Thank you.